I'm going to take my time and talk about technology and information. Now, technology and information have gotten a well-deserved bad rap recently. You've all heard about Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. And what you've learned is that the machine learning mechanisms around us, the massive information that we have, is in the select hands of a few. And the concentration of power that it creates, and we've talked about power all day, is in fact creating even more inequitable of a society. So in this talk, what I want to do is use some technology and show what could happen if we took information, that new thing that is the currency of our life now, and if we turned it towards the populace, towards the citizen, toward the community, and provided power to those who actually deserve power. Now, I'm going to do that with visualization, and I'm starting with a beautiful picture of the Earth, and hopefully they can bring it online. Let's use the center screen too, please. This is an example of how we can take information today and really give you a whole new perspective on the world. But what I want to do first is show you the ways in which the development of information technology, the progress that we have all around us, has introduced very undesirable externalities into our world. So I'll be using a special interface here called EarthTime, and uh, you're all going to be able to use this after my talk. So that's an exciting aspect of where we're headed with this thing. I want to start with a friend of mine, Robert Mugga, and I'm going to go global first, and we'll go very, very micro-local at the end of the talk. But Robert Mugga has an Igarape Institute in Brazil. He studies urban fragility of the top 2,500 cities in the world. And what he's got by measuring urban fragility is a pretty remarkable notion. He can show you, for every city on Earth, the degree to which it's fragile. And the way he measures fragility is he measures the access to clean air, access to clean water, access to fair labor practices, fair housing practices, corruption in government, corruption in the retention of visas for foreign, foreign working migrants. He takes all these things, crime, uh, pollution, inequity, mashes them together into a little bubble. And what you see on this map, for every country, for every city, excuse me, is that bubble. And as you can imagine, the bigger and redder, the worse. And you can see the year 2000, and I'll play it forward in time for you. And what you see is pretty depressing. By the year 2016, what you see is massive amounts of fragility across Central Africa and the Middle East. But notice what's happening in the United States, too. The same decade, two decades, over which we were basically at the level of uh, stability of Europe, by the end of this decade, were twice as bad. What you're seeing here is a visualization of the externalities of what we call progress. Progress to us has become the idea of never-ending gains in value for corporate America. But that never-ending gain in value comes with a cost that is completely invisible to us, which is the fragility that we all face because of the inequities in society that serve upon us again. And I want to turn to one particular form of fragility first. Um, and it's in fact one of the measures he uses. This is a map that has not been seen before. Uh, we just uh, demoed this at Davos for the first time to world leaders. So now you all get to see it too. It's a map that shows you particulate pollution around the world, everywhere around the world over time. And it's important because if you see yellow or red or purple, you see poor health. You see COPD, you see asthma, you see early death, you see cardiovascular arrhythmia. You see everything that causes quality of life to be miserable. And ironically, you see it happening precisely because of progress. If we go to India and China, and I play forward over time, look what happens to India and China from 2000 to today. Just to show you that again, before, now. That's depressing. That means the progress that they are following in our footsteps on is resulting in levels of air pollution that is completely unacceptable. Now, I wanted to come up with a way to give you perspective for how bad this problem is worldwide. So I decided to do it in a way that's not very comfortable, but is very real. Here is an animation of all worldwide violence, every organized violence fatality around the world. Not a nice map to look at, but you can see the widespread nature of violence, and you can connect that in your head with all the news stories you hear about violence. So how many deaths occur from that? And let's compare that to pollution, shall we? So here we have a map of all mortality in 2016 due to violence. So the bigger the circle, and it's proportional, the bigger the circle, the more fatalities in that country due to violence. Now, think about what you think you're going to see. You know what I'm about to do. I'm going to overlay for you mortality due to pollution on top of violence. So pink circles, violence. Those big red circles, pollution. How much news does that get? It's killing multiples more people in nearly every country except for the ultra-violent regimes where we've been messing with political systems, such as the Middle East. But everywhere else you look, from Africa to China, 
to the United States. In fact, pollution is a far bigger killer than what gets all the news. And fundamentally what you're seeing is the fact that we have disenfranchised ourselves from the dangers that we face. When I talk to my friends in Mumbai, in India, and I describe to them what's happening to them in terms of pollution, their response is, we can't do anything about it, it's the government's problem. They feel completely fatalistic and disconnected from the solution. When we started working with folks in uh, Avalon and Ben Avon, the communities near Neville Island, when the Shenango Coke factory was making Coke there a couple years ago, they describe sweeping soot out of their porches every morning. They describe keeping their windows shut at night when it was hot and humid. Because if you open it, the stench will keep you awake. So better to just sweat all night in a humid house than to let the cool night air in. And they describe calling the health department and saying, it stinks, do something about it. We think it's that Coke factory right there. And the health department's saying, well, it could be the Coke factory, or maybe it's the paint factory. So since we don't know who it is, we don't know who to find, so we won't find anybody. Nice answer. That process of disenfranchisement is something that I want to talk about today. It's fundamentally the process of alienation. We have, through our progress, through the way that we create society structure, alienated society itself, the community members, from the ability to have discourse about solutions. Because taken away from them the information that they can use to be experts and to be in a peer relationship with their own elected officials. And it's a fundamental problem that we have. It applies to pollution. It doesn't stop with pollution. Alienation cuts across every cloth of society. So to show you that, I'm going to switch to housing for a second. So I'm going to start showing you some dot maps. This is pretty exciting uh, reveal for us all at the Create Lab, because what we've done is we've ingested all census data ever and all American cons consumer survey data ever for the whole United States. So we have along every demographic line for every household in America demographic information that we can show you. So let's show you a few things that start to give you a sense of the alienation we have in housing. And then we'll, I promise I'll have some good news at the end of this, at least some ideas about how to proceed. So here you're seeing two dots. And remember, a dot is a household. I'm not summarizing, I'm not abstracting, I'm not graphing. This is actual data for actual houses in Pittsburgh. But what I'm showing you in magenta, in blue, is everybody who owns a home. And in red, I'm saying that wrong. In red, it's everybody who owns a home. In blue, it's everybody who's renting. And this is 1990. And what's interesting for you to know is if you think about ownership of information and ownership of equity in housing, Ownership is a very important kind of stability that it gives us. And if I go forward to 2016, look how much more blue there is going to be. And the depressing part with this, and this is just taking time to come up because I'm giving a talk, so it's going to be slow, of course. But it'll come up. The depressing part about this is that it is precisely the so-called progress of the mortgage industry, the banking practices that created the wrong types of loans for individuals throughout our city that resulted in this switch. Just to play that again, 1990, today. Look how much more blue there is and how much less red. Those are all people who owned their house and don't anymore. Every one of those new blue dots is distraught, is a kind of grief. And it's a kind of grief we didn't need. And it's ascribed to the progress of newfangled banking practices. Now, of course we can cut this across race as well. And that's interesting because we need to understand the disparity in inequity that we have as we think about ownership across race. What you're seeing here is for all whites in Pittsburgh, how much they own and how much they rent. Again, blue is rental and red is owning. Now that's African Americans. It's all blue. And it's highly uh, isolated geographically. So again, whites, blacks. So you can see even at the level of race, you have a huge disparity in the inequities we create in society just based on house ownership and rental. And just to show you the structural imbalance that that causes, I have two more pictures for you here that are dot maps. Every dot that you see here that's blue or dark is a dot where people are paying less than a fifth of their income for house costs. That means mortgage or rental. The red dots are people who are paying more than a third of their income. In other words, their income is driven primarily by their home and nothing else, leaving very little for the rest of life. This picture, this is for homeowners, and you can see it's mostly blue and purple. If I go to renters, the picture is exactly the opposite, it's red. 
So we have a structural imbalance, and then on top of that structural imbalance, the very people who have no equity, who don't get to own anything, also pay hugely larger proportions of their take-home income to rent that thing that they're throwing the money away on and not even building equity on. What is just about that society? Why does that give us a pathway toward a future that we can be proud of? Oh, by the way, the answer to that question is it's not just and it doesn't give us a pathway to the future. So here's a kind of a heartbreaking uh, set of dots to show you. This is all evictions in Pittsburgh last year. Every single dot is an eviction in Pittsburgh. And you can zoom in on your own time. I'll give you the URL. You can see every single eviction. And boy, it gets interesting when you take this and overlay it with a, overlay it with a race map of Pittsburgh. But I want to show you a particular aspect of this that I think is just uh, criminal. Here's a map showing single parents in red, single parents who have a child at home. So take a place that's red, anywhere you want, and focus on it, and now I'll go to evictions. And guess what? That's where the evictions are. So the evictions in our town, the systematic creation of barriers that stop people from having hope for the future, are precisely co-located with the place where you have single parents with children living. What does that tell you about the way society provides value to community? And that's a fundamental challenge that I believe we face. So how do we overcome all this? I've shown you really bad news now, pretty thoroughly, I think. And it's interesting, when I talk to my friends in the world of machines and automation and robotics, it's the same story. There's a disenfranchisement with the labor market. People don't know how they're going to derive dignity in a world where more and more work is going to be done by computers in lieu of us. At the same time, I hear the same sense of dis disenfranchisement when I hear about housing practices and the fact that fewer and fewer people own their house. At the same time, I hear the same thing about pollution. And by the way, if you care about these three issues, I'm going to throw out three names of books for you. Mindless is a book that's about alienation in work. And Diamond is a book that's a great demonstration of alienation from pollution from the cracker plant in Louisiana, in Diamond, Louisiana. And Evicted is an outstanding book that shows you the structural alienation caused through eviction. So if you've got to read some, three, some books, I would highly recommend Diamond, Evicted, and Mindless. All one-word titles, which is perfect. So how do we overcome this? I believe the answer is straightforward, but requires society to change the power hegemonic structure of society itself. The answer is ownership. It's what you call cooperative ownership. Do a search in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette on Belmar Gardens. Belmar Gardens was a housing area developed with federally insured mortgage. And those federally insured mortgages in 1952 enabled the residents of Belmar Gardens to be owners of Belmar Gardens. All mortgages paid off. It's now a fully owned establishment where the carrying costs, the rental cost fees, haven't gone up in 20 years where there's an election of local homeowners, the residents, to create a local council that decides how to solve problems, where when they have to do a $2 million capital fix, they can get a local loan from a bank, they do the fix, and they pay it all back, and they're still fine. And Belmar is not alone, Sheridan's another example. But these fly in the face of the standard way capitalism considers ownership and rental to work. These are fundamentally about cooperative ownership, about putting citizens in a privileged status in comparison to corporation. We do this in the pollution side too, by the way, and I want to show you some examples of that. And so here's a really fun example of that. How do you create that sense of power in a uh, community? Well, that community, Ben Avon, and Avalon that I talked about, Create Lab went out and worked with them. They installed cameras in their attic windows facing onto the, fl the plant that was giving off illegal plumes of pollution. And then they took those camera inputs and conjoined them with smell reports and with federal air quality sensors and wind direction sensors. And they did this not for a day, not for a week, not for a month, but for a whole year. And they did this and did this until they had ridiculous amounts, thousands of hours of evidence showing in a way that's undeniable the pollution that's illegal coming off the plant. Then they invited the Division Three coordinator for the EPA to come in and they stuck him in a chair in front of a giant screen showing this. And what did he do? He got up in the face of the undeniable and said, this is unacceptable. And that was the beginning of the end for that plant. That was the community having empowerment and ownership over information. Not Facebook, not Google, not Cambridge Analytica. It was a community of citizens who want change, given the tools to be fluent enough to make change with information. And we spread that. Uh, we spread that further afield now 
because the east end has the same problem thanks to the Monongahela Valley, where we have 10 times the industrial facilities as we, as we had at Shenango. 10 times more emissions coming off into the valley, snaking up and going right over Squirrel Hill. So we created this thing called Smell Pittsburgh, an app funded by the Heinz Endowments, and that's not it, that's it. And what's interesting about Smell Pittsburgh is it allows any of you to report when the air stinks. That's really useful, by the way. Your nose is an outstanding measure of volatile organic compounds, which are toxic. And so I can, for instance, play you an animation of April 14th. That was a bad day. That was an inversion layer day. It was warm. The factories were actually pluming out toxic emissions. These little um, orange circles you can see and, and yellow circles are federal air quality monitors and all the triangles that are showing up. Those are residents in Pittsburgh taking ownership of the fact that they can report the smell. And if I actually go and read their reports, it's frankly heartbreaking, but let's read you a couple of the reports. So we'll go into Frick Park area here. That's a good one to read. How about this one? What's it say? Amazingly powerful stench, acrid, industrial, city, and then in all capitals, wrong. How about this one? Nausea, eyes burning, had to shut windows on this cool night. The stink woke me up. Industrial sulfur stinks. Why always on weekend nights? Actually, there's a reason for that. Enforcement action by the health department lowers on weekends. So it's a great time to pollute. Now you know why weekends are bad. When you create a site like this, though, what you do with the culture of the community is that you empower them to have a voice. They can now report when it stinks. They can see others doing the same thing. They don't feel alone any longer. And by the way, every report they make becomes an actionable federal air quality report. So now the health department has to go and investigate. So now you've privileged the individual and given them the level of power that they actually deserve. So I'm gonna show you one final visual here and then argue for change. That final visual is actually really depressing too. Surprise. Poverty. This is a dot for every family uh, in Pittsburgh that is under the poverty line. That's how much we have. And by the way, green is black. So look at the concentration of blacks in poverty across Pittsburgh. And this data is national. Everything that I'm showing you is national. So you can do this anywhere in the nation and you can see how much green there is on this map. So anybody who doesn't want to believe in structural inequality needs to deep dive into this data and really get to know it well. This is the problem we face. We fundamentally have an inequitable society. We've alienated our own citizenry from the information that can help them and put it in the hands of corporations which use it for what? To, to throw elections and to get us to buy things we don't need to maximize profit. That doesn't sound like the best use of information to me. Fundamentally, I have three charges that I wanna leave you with, and that's the end of my talk. Charge number one, we have a website for you where you can explore all this information, but more importantly, where I want you to share this information with those who aren't here. It's p4.earthtime.org, it's that simple. Any mobile device can use it, you scroll through it and you can deep dive into the information as you see fit, p4.earthtime.org. Charge number two, we aren't going to make it with one story like this, just this one story that we have at p4.earthtime.org. We need a thousand stories that take data and turn the data into narrative that moves people's hearts so that we can forge the common ground for discourse that will force people to look in the eye the inequities that we have that are structural. So I need a thousand stories. And for a thousand stories to happen, I need you to help us take people who understand the stories of Pittsburgh and turn them into exactly what you're gonna see online. So I need your help. And third, and last, and most importantly, what we need is for all of you to work on community ownership, on the idea of ownership writ large. You've heard that already in several speakers today by different words. That means we have to fundamentally understand and ingrain in ourselves that the privileged status is not given to the elected official, it's not given to the CEO of the corporation, and it's not given to the chief executive of the nonprofit. The privileged status, the top of the power control system, is the community and the citizen in that community. And everybody else exists merely to serve them. If we can invert that power relationship, then if we can use information to create narratives that truly change people's minds, I believe we can create the common ground that will cause us to have no choice but to actually hew a better future. Thank you.